Surely the best moment so far in the Olympics was the men's 100 meter final. It was the closest final in history. That was amazing, but no, for me, it's gotta be Keely Hodgkinson. She was inspired by Jessica Ennis Hill in 2012 winning gold, and she has now been the first British female to win gold since that moment. I'm biased, but 1500 meters, surely the most exciting race that we've seen so far. Maybe even the 10,000 meters, one of the fastest races we've seen so far, but it doesn't look like we're going to agree. So we've put together some of the best moments from what we've seen at the Olympics so far. World records, huge upsets, lots of banter and a little sprinkling of science. Let's get stuck in. Welcome to 10 Days in Paris with the Running Channel podcast and thank you so much to ASICS for bringing us out here and for making this happen. It's been a dramatic few days but I tell you what the first moment Sarah and I walked into the stadium yesterday morning it is not like walking into a major stadium like you won't go into Wembley or you normally go into it and you get that wow it was a bigger oh because mm. they've changed Is that French that. or oh, it was oh. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they've changed the whole look of, yeah. of, of the it's Stade purple. de France. It's the purple. track is purple. Yeah. yeah, and then you've also got obviously nationalities from absolutely everywhere, and like it, the heat, the tension. Mm. It, it it felt yeah, so very it, different to walking into a normal stadium. It's so cool, and obviously, like when you watch it on TV, they're showing kind of one event at a time. Mm. But what you might not realize is that track and field events are going on at the same time so we were watching uh hammer throw we were watching high jump we were watching long jump yeah. and actually where we were sat we were in front of the kind of 100 meter straight but the long jump was happening on the other side so you'd you'd be watching kind of the 100 meter athletes getting their starting blocks setting up yeah. running towards the marshals that have their arms outstretched yeah. on the line trying to stop them go past them and then you just hear this eruption from the other side of the crowd and it would be because someone was about to do a long jump yeah. and it's the atmosphere yeah. is just incredible so you both went to the stadium yesterday morning mm. what was you sort of described the atmosphere i've been hearing things about the way the french crowd are responding to the french athletes and i'm sort of desperate to get into the stadium oh and- wow Wow. Just as soon as you see the letters F-R-A on a top. Yes, yeah. yeah. The crowd response and reaction so is incredible. I mean, and that's not that's not to the sort of medal favourites either, right? Or household names necessarily. That's every French athlete. Anyone, yeah. I think Which so. is incredible. And it must feel so special to compete in a home games. Did you have that with 2012? Yeah, it was weird. I actually enjoyed Beijing more because it felt like as a first Olympics, going to the other side of the world, doing this really exotic thing that I'd watched on TV, mm. as opposed to London, where you kind of, I lived in London at the time. So that was a bit strange. Was it a bit annoying being like, well, I could just could have just commuted in here? Yeah, especially because <laughs> we had a holding camp in Portugal. So they flew us out to Portugal to do all the training for a month beforehand. And then we flew back in like four or five days really? before our, our event. Wow. But yeah, in, in the stand, the moment that you, they've changed the way athletes come out now, actually, because they, we used to come out fairly well dressed still whereas now all the athletes come out ready ready, ready to go and they don't carry anything yeah so they've sort of almost got rid of do you remember the old box carriers yeah. they used to stand next to the blocks and you put all of your take your kit off and put it in a bit like the swimmers still do they come out in their big kind of hoodies and overcoats and headphones oh and my gosh the amount of like branded swimming kit that you get oh, yeah. i'm like oh that's cool i want that it's different <laughs> they have a park and they have a, but yeah now the athletes yeah. come out ready to run they might have a bottle of water they're carrying or something but everything else has already been discarded under the stadium um, but I think they therefore bring them out not quite as early as we used to come out. So we used to come out 10 or 15 minutes before we started probably sometimes. But yeah, the moment that I remember coming out from underneath the stands, mm. you know, you, you, you watch football documentaries or whatever, and there's always someone who taps their hand on the logo of the yeah. club or whatever. It's that kind of moment where you emerge from underneath the stands onto the track, different mm. tracks, different stadiums, you'd come out in different places. At London, I think we came out at the 200 meter mark and then ran down the back straight. Mm. And the moment that I popped out, and I definitely wasn't a household name, but I had head to toe Team GB kit on. Yeah. 100,000 people just went crazy. The repage. What does that mean? The repage. 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 It's going to take me <laughs> some time. What so does it second mean? Second chance. Essentially. Yeah, it does mean second chance. So, so the rowers have always had a repage system. Right. And it, I never really understood it. And then this is the very first time they've ever had it in athletics. So basically, what it means is that nobody's been knocked out yet, which is totally different to previous years. Previous years, it was always. First five or six, or depending on the event, miss the cut. You first gone. three, no, first three would make the cut automatically. Yeah, yeah. So you get one of those big cues, yeah. Your name, but then the next, however many overall, sixth, next six fastest or next ten fastest, would right? Get these fastest losers spots, or that's what we always call them, fastest losers, which is not a very nice way of describing them, but mm-hmm. next fastest, and they'd get a little cue, like a lowercase cue. So all of those go to semi-finals. Yes, or depending on the round, yeah. So yeah. usually in every round there would have been hey an automatic qualifying section, and then. Um, this kind of fastest losers, so the next six fastest. 
Um, that was unfair in a lot of cases because if you're in the semifinals, for example, when I ran in Beijing, mm -hmm. it was first five from two semifinals plus two fastest losers. Yeah. So it made 12 for the final. And if you're in the second semifinal, there's a massive advantage because probably seven of you are going to go through because all it takes is someone... Because if the, the first semifinal is slightly tactical in the first lap right. and you lose a little bit of time, it's easy for the second semifinal to run faster. So I think that's what they've tried to rule out here. But what the repechage means is that if you didn't make, I think it was the first six, automatically qualified yesterday from three heats in the 1500, which makes 18 people qualified. They want 24 for two semifinals with 12. Yeah. Um, so now anyone that didn't make the first six in their heat comes back today. We're recording this on a Saturday. So the following day for a repechage heat, there are two heats of all of the people that didn't get through. And then the first three in each of those heats, that's even what's much more cutthroat now because there'll be... I think there's 12 or 14 in each of those repressage heats and only the first three in each of them will go. Only the through. first three. I see. So that but, gives you another six to, but, to make but it. But it does give right. people another chance who've had a bad race who can think, right, I've trained for this for four years yeah. and go, right, mm -hmm. let's go for it again. Would you have wanted that? Like, are there any points in your career where you would have thought, oh, actually, yeah, that would have helped? No, I think, I, th I think that either you think that you can be competitive mm -hmm. and make it through the rounds and potentially challenge for a medal or you don't. Yeah, and so I, I think that most of the people who think that they have a chance in the final or w would like sort of this would they probably consider this to be almost irrelevant to them. Um, it's interesting that the world athletics reasoning for it supposedly is that yeah, exactly what Rick says. You trained for this for a long time. So it means that everyone who comes to the Olympics mm. and this is only from 200 meters up to 1500 meters at those events. Okay, so the 100 doesn't have it, and then the 5k and 10k don't have it. Interesting. Uh, that could change, though. If everybody likes it, they might bring it in for the 100. I think the 100, the reason they don't have it is they already have a preliminary round. Oh, yeah, so they yeah, have a preliminary yeah. round where the faster athletes don't run. And then the, the faster athletes come in what, what is essentially the second round for the heats. So it's preliminary, right. heats, semi-final, final. Um, so there's already four rounds technically in the 100, which is why they don't have this system. Yeah. Um, and yeah, what Athletics is saying, this, this means that everyone in those events where they have a repertoire get two races and they've trained really hard for this. One of my friends, they messaged me when we were talking about it yesterday, just saying, it's not, it's not school sports day. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't need, you, don't need, you don't need to give everyone a second yeah. chance. Because there I is don't a... know though, but if you look at the discrepancy between the, the different heats, yeah. like there must be so many athletes that there was, there was a difference between like the winner of one heat, I think it was like two seconds different of the yeah. winner of the other heat. So if you, if you do end up in a heat where... Because I know you've said as well, like you actually would prefer to be racing now because yeah. of the way that the 1500 is run, especially if it's so tactical, it must help some people. The 10,000 meters was the very first gold of the track and field program if, for the Olympics to be awarded. If, that was last night. If you look at the results page of it, yeah. there's almost no athletes that haven't either run a PB, a season best, national record. a national record, yeah. or broken the Olympic record as well. Yeah, so it's the fastest, it, the, the first 13 runners broke the previous Olympic record for 10,000 meters, which was 2701, which isn't hanging about. And that, that it was one in 2643. They went through 5K in 1323. Bear in mind my park run world record when I held that was 1348. So they're 25 seconds faster than that. Wow. And then they did another another 5K. And it was, yeah. And it, it's not cold here. It's pretty oh, warm. No, it, no, it's not did cold have, at all. Did they have water stations out on the course? I don't know if they had water stations on the track. I don't, no one took them. Right. Because you couldn't, at that pace, you couldn't, do anything with it. The, so <laughs> need water stations you in the just stand. Change it, it about yeah, a yeah. bit. It would be like you just be throwing it in your face. Yeah. So Joshua Chapter guy won. So he's already the world record holder, and now finally as the Olympic champion, came second in Tokyo. Um, and what was interesting is that the three Ethiopian athletes clearly had team tactics to try to just run a really hard race right at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the one of those three athletes, Aragawi, who did the least helping out at the front to set the pace, is the one who ended up getting the silver medal. And neither of the other Ethiopians got a medal at all. So, but but they were all incredibly fast. Like it was so fast, the first thirteen men, I think, finished inside the previous Olympic record. Yeah, and and also to add context to that, the so these these guys were were ticking off sixty four second laps. So if you go down to your local track and try to run one lap in sixty four seconds, we've done it, and then do that twenty five times, it's staggering how fast they're going. But yeah. also, if you think about the progression of stuff like makes me want to eat a croissant <laughs> <laughs> so right, we've got some right in front of us right now but i've got some here just some stats that in tokyo it was uh one of the ethiopian guys who was making a lot of the pace Berega, uh, solomon Berega, uh won in 27 43 so a whole minute slower wow 
Mo Farah, his second 5K to win in Rio was really, really fast, but they started much slower and he ran 27.05, so 22 seconds slower. Um, and then in, he ran 27.30 in London, so it's never been anywhere near this fast, really. Mm. Um, and the times in 10K have moved on so much that we're talking about how fast this is, but the automatic qualifying time for the World Championship next year is 27 minutes zero. So mm. you, do, you to qualify for next year's World Championships, you have to run faster than you know the Olympic record anyone's won in the Olympics in, in history until yesterday. That's well, crazy. now 13 of them can go. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. The Olympic table, do right. you know how it works? No, actually, I don't. No? Yes. Andy? Oh. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you would It'd hope. be a bit that. worrying if Andy didn't know how it works. <laughs> Although you guys have always make, make fun of me for not having an Olympic medal, so maybe yeah. my opinion doesn't Oh, matter. but you made it to the Olympics, and actually that is quite impressive. Is what? it more impressive now that you've been here, though? Yeah. And seeing the, the high. Well, I do. The... I, yeah, I do think... There's there's been quite a lot of references to how when you watch the Olympics from home, you go from having no understanding what the sport is that you're watching to ten minutes later being like, oh, they're not going to be happy with that. Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> or yeah. like, oh, that wasn't a very good execution. Yeah. And I do think it's the same thing of like, even last night we'll come onto it. We watched the hundred meter final, and it was all about the gold medal, and everyone was discussing it. But ah. even like if you're silver or bronze, incredible. Ah, but but sorry, it is. How does it work? All about the gold medal. Yeah. Right, so and why is that? It is ranked on how many gold medals you get. However, if there is a tie, it then goes down to how many silver and bronze medals oh, you so get. Oh, so it's not just total medals? <laughs> it's not total no. medals. Also, total medals, the US is leading the table quite clearly. Yeah. But actually, on the accurate table as it stands, China is leading. Yeah, so you, you, could have, you could have 40 silvers and 40 bronzes and you'd still be ranked behind a country that has one, one gold and nothing else really isn't that interesting that's so unfair yeah. did you know that no i didn't I've, I I've, didn't. I've always looked at the table for about 20 years and thought I but, just it's, don't called the, it's, but it's called the medal table it's not called the yeah. gold yeah. medal I, i've always thought table. it should be like i don't agree three with points it. for gold exactly. yeah. That's what I was yeah. Thinking. yeah yeah, yeah. three two one yeah. make it simple yeah yeah hey well we've just reinvented the olympic medal table if i was a country I think I would so thrive annoyed. at being second yeah. best. Yes, completely. <laughs> I don't uh, think I'd excel to gold. Yeah. I just think I'd be a country of, you know, like uh, uh, In fact, if you, if you were a country, yeah. or, or maybe if you were the monarch of a country. Yeah, love it. We've been given a title for you <laughs> through, <laughs> through, my, through my Strava comments. <laughs> oh, uh, oh uh, good. Uh, I was someone, someone asked me what it's like to work with her royal snarkiness. snarkiness. <laughs> 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 I learned a cool fact yesterday as well. Yeah. There's a bell at this Olympic. Mm. Yeah, and it's we, massive as well. Massive bell, and we heard it <laughs> get rung twice. Is it just by the winners, Sarah? It is just by the winners. So do you want to know why the bell is here and what's going on with the bell? Go on. So We're the not bell... talking about Rick, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of borderline. I don't have to edit that out. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I could not so, say it. Just let that glaze over you. <laughs> um, the bell is being rung by every single like winner of every event which after the olympics yeah. will be in notre dame no way yeah so She's going into the because the cathedral's being renovated right yeah and so they've fire yeah and they've actually so the bell's been rung several times it was in the rugby sevens which finished before the athletics started and it's now continued to be rung throughout the athletics and it's kind of symbolizing that the sound of the olympics will live on in paris forever because it will then go into notre dame wow so it's this is the winners that get to ring it yeah, I think it's, so, yeah. It's a new bell. Yeah. And it's yeah, a yeah. bell that was not at previous Olympics. No. Right. So, yeah, it was made in Normandy. It is, in fact, part of the refurbishment of Notre Dame Cathedral, engraved with the emblem of Paris 2024. It's going to be delivered to the cathedral after the Games. That's fantastic. In one of the towers. I mean, Paris are just doing this really well, aren't they? Yeah, I think it's like a really cool, you know, like they're trying to be sustainable, so not that many yeah. things have been built in order to... Um, kind of put on the games like in London like you can go and visit the uh, the pl place in Stratford Olympic, Olympic Park, Park yeah. <laughs> um, but this is a really nice like Notre Dame is that kind of iconic place that you want to visit in Paris and it's quite cool that a part of the Olympics will it live on there so we don't we normally talk about running but we were right in front of these incredible uh, in the men's shot putters last night yeah and they're hurling this thing I think 22 plus meters mm. um, and one, the atmosphere was incredible when the, the roar that went up when one of them launched it a really long way. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to ask Rick, how heavy do you think the men's shot putt is? Mm. Oh, that's such a good question. I'm, I imagine it's about three to four kg. Yeah, double that. 
No way. 7.25, 7.26 kilograms. It's at 16 pounds. Yeah. How, how far do you think you two could throw it? Well, so... I don't know whether I could pick it up. No, I don't. So it's 16 pounds Sarah's for the men. To, Sarah's been going eight, to the gym a lot. Around 8.8, 8, I think, pounds for the women. Yes, but yeah, I don't oh, it's a think... Different weight for the women. Yeah, yes, a different it's weight. It's slightly half, over half Yeah. Weight. Right. But like the... the uh, I mean, I remember doing it at school and I could barely lift it. 8 kg. Yeah. I think wow. I think I would genuinely struggle to launch an uh, nearly eight kilogram shot put more than like where it falls when I let go of it. Women's 100 meter final last night. Shikari Richardson was the favorite yeah. going into it. Um, Shelly Ann Fraser Price didn't run, which was yeah, a the, huge upset. Yeah, she did. There was some, her and Shikari Richardson both got denied access to the warm up track at some point. Yeah. We're going to talk about the warm up track a bit later, but the. But they then, I think, then uh, Shelley and Fraser Price has sustained an injury on the warm-up track, so then withdrew. Withdrew, yeah. So Shikari Richardson went in as the favourite, and obviously 100 metres, it's only 10 seconds, so it's a really weird crowd atmosphere because yeah. you're just so excited, but you don't yeah. actually have that much time. Yeah. And then it, Shikari Richardson got silver, yes. and there was this moment, like... Silence. It, it all, yeah, this, it the, all the happened so The stadium was so in shock. It, yeah. it reminded me of when the money I put on a donkey to win the Grand National two years ago actually won. <laughs> what, what was the odds of that? Oh, 120 sorry. to 1. Incredible. <laughs> Whacked a fiver on it. But that was another incredible moment where it was St. Lucia's first medal. Yeah. And like the, the reaction was oh, was just unbelievable. Yeah. Like we were obviously excited. We had Team GB athlete in there as well. But like I, you just felt the entire crowd get behind this person. And obviously like Shikari Richardson must have been a bit devastated as well. But second in the world was pretty good. Yeah, you, you saw Julian Alfred who ended up winning. Yeah. She took off from the start and, and it wasn't really ever in doubt. What was in doubt was that how people were going to react to it. Like you say, I've never heard something like that. So I don't know whether it would have come across on the television. But just this this expectation that Shikari Richardson was going to win. Yeah. And then in the last 50 meters, it just, there was this roar. And then was she crossed shocked. the line, silence for one or two seconds, just that beat. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, and, and then I think it was everyone just going again. like, oh my gosh. Because it was fast as well, 1072. Yeah. Um, and, and also, yeah, you mentioned British interest. So Daryl Nita came fourth, agonizing place to come in the Olympics. And then actually, Dino Asher Smith hadn't made it into the final. So she mm -hmm. got knocked out. She came fifth in her semi-final and I saw um I was catching it with some of the analysis afterwards and that's the weird thing in the track right you don't get any of the you're in the stadium so you get the atmosphere but you don't hear and you don't see the athlete interviews yeah. either so she was pretty distraught but also I, I love Dean I think she's so eloquent she's she's such like a good ambassador for athletics and so like interesting mm. I think I, I was guilty as an athlete when I got interviewed of being boring and and so unwilling no to, hey, you hey, boring hey. never sarah never <laughs> this is so unfair but yeah. <laughs> carry on but interesting you you're so worried about he's grown into his media profile <laughs> <laughs> i'm a trained media professional <laughs> yeah. i do a podcast i hate you both um, <laughs> okay rick you have two minutes to complain off you go yeah and then, we, and then we're going to talk about two Olympics minutes and all of the exciting bits that yeah two happening. minutes and you just wasted 15 seconds of it. okay we did a one hour <laughs> challenge through paris mm -hmm. now the aim of the game was simple it was to run as far as you can in an hour but, however there was a twist yeah you had to go as the bird flies or, more commonly as the crow flies, <laughs> as the crow flies. <laughs> in paris it's known as the bird okay yeah, 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 yeah. Loiseau, as lo as Loiseau, I don't know what flies. Is it right? And so we basically had to go as far as we can in one direction. However, we all had to start at certain points in Paris. I had to start at the Notre Dame Cathedral. Yeah. Try running <laughs> around the Notre Dame Cathedral in the middle of the day in 27 degrees in Paris. Trying during, to during, during the, the Olympics, Olympics on a Sunday. On a Sunday. <laughs> it's almost like the producers had planned it. To yeah. Be unpleasant. It was. Bleak. And you once asked me, Sarah, about four weeks ago, do yeah. you enjoy all your runs? And I rather sillily said, yes. Yeah. Has that, has that now changed? That's now changed. <laughs> <laughs> how long did you, how long before, from leaving the hotel to then getting back to the hotel, did your one hour run take you? Three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and do you want to know the worst thing? You went out and did yours. And then me and Andy left the hotel at the same time to go and do ours. And we were like, what's Rick on about? It's taking three hours to do this. Cut to four hours later. Oh. Because there was also a cycling race going on throughout the entirety of Paris. And it's, it's quite a long cycling race. So a lot of roads were affected. So to get back from our yeah. one hour location, took us about an hour and a half on a bike. Yeah. So Rick was loving it. Um, but... 
No. Alan hasn't complained about it since. He's, <laughs> no. he's hardly mentioned it. I, I sat in a cafe after you lot went out in the afternoon. I thought, right, um, the, the, the lunch budget's blown here. <laughs> Got myself a couple of carafes of, you know, French version of the Gavi. And yeah, just to, uh, just Gavi being a wine, by the way, yes. not Gaviscon. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> yeah, Gavi's an Italian sat, wine. Sat there, had a beautiful, had some great food by myself. Read the Spectator, toasted the King. Like, it was literally. <laughs> <laughs> had, had, if had a anyone's lovely... wondering how does Rick decompress, <laughs> that genuinely is how we got a yeah, picture to prove it, it, so. it. I just needed to to really cool down after what was a traumatic um, afternoon running. Noah Lyles actually ran a personal best to win nine point seven nine, I think. Um, and he won by 0.005 in a photo yeah. finish. And he said as well in a in an interview, he thought he hadn't won. Yeah. Um, and then he went up to someone else, was like, oh, good Making run. Yeah, 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 thought yeah. he'd won. Then saw his name appear on the screen. And in the interview, he was just like, and then I went, oh my goodness gracious, I'm incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I so, love it. So 0 0.12, 1 hundredth of a second covered the entire field. You come last in 9.91. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Rick. Bring up the stopwatch and Sarah, bring up the stopwatch on your watch, please, right, right. now, if you can. Okay. And then I'm challenging you right now, literally as fast as you can, press the button twice. So start and stop your watch. What were we aiming for? Point one two. two. Oh my gosh. <gasps> that was. I literally did that instantaneously. And it was one eight. 23. <laughs> so 23 hundreds for Rick. Your yeah. reaction slow speed. Finger. So yours is point one eight. If point I do it as well. Point one three. So like. Oh, you, you can tell me the Olympian is. <laughs> yeah, you've got Olympic, <laughs> Olympic fingers. Twice as fast as Reaction me in the fingers. Speed. Um, but so wow. it's almost impossible to stop, start and stop your stopwatch. Even the producers behind the cameras here and in the podcast studio are now it. trying to do exactly What's the same so thing. What's so interesting though is because we were watching it in a, in a pub, we were like, what I'm sure everyone at home was doing, which is like, tell us who won, tell us yeah. who won. Yeah, but this is in but hundreds, you, Sarah. Yeah, this but is then in hundreds, you, not but, thousands Yeah, I know, but then you, you can even see like, the, to be an official organizer at that point must have been like, oh gosh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quickly yeah. we need to do it. But if you look at all of the kind of analysis and them crossing the line, like it it was so close. ASICs are doing some incredible work through their mind and body athlete support program. And this I think is even more pertinent right now because we spotted a post from an athlete, Ollie Hoare on Instagram yesterday, who's a 1500 meter runner. He's Commonwealth Games champion from 2022. Uh, he's run 3.30, he's one of the best guys in the world, but he didn't make it through the heats and then subsequently got knocked out in the repechage as well. And you sort of, I think it's easy to forget that athletes are human, mm. but he posted essentially, I'm summarizing here, saying that he'd made the mistake of looking at his social media, both before his first round and then in between the first round and the repechage. It had a really negative impact on him because he was getting negative abuse, comments on his performance, um, it, he didn't say exactly what people had been saying to him, but clearly enough that he then felt he had to now delete his Instagram, go off social media mm. for the rest of the year. And the thing that ASICs have been doing is they've teamed up with a, a company called Signify to provide their athletes with a kind of AI assisted social media bubble almost to protect them from the abuse they might receive. This is really clever, isn't it? And, you know, Ollie Hoare himself is a really good athlete. He came first in the Commonwealth Games 1500 in 2022. So, He's had a bad day, you know, basically. And then it's basically taking him over the edge, hasn't it? Yeah, but if you think of any athlete on any level, any runner, mm. have, like, anyone listening to this, have you ever gone on a run that's gone a little bit wrong? Yeah. Mm. Yes, the answer is, of course, yeah. going to be yes. Rick had his one-hour challenge yesterday, which he hated. But the the thing that I just find, if you think of it on a human level, if you went for a job and you didn't get it, Mm. how much worse would you feel if you had 10 people come up to you being like, oh, I'm really disappointed you didn't get that job. Yeah. They're already thinking that. You don't, you don't need to reinforce it. And also that's probably not the, the extent of what people are getting. Like there are athletes across the board that are going to come yeah. away disappointed. There are only three medals that you can walk away with in each yeah. event. And I just think the it's great that sponsors like ASICs are putting in place things to protect no, it people. Really good, but it? it's also on a level of like... They just shouldn't have to be experiencing that abuse when they're just turning up and trying to run well. Yesterday, Sarah and I had to drag you out of the stadium. <laughs> yeah, me and Andy were trying to make like a relatively like classic British thing. There are yeah. 80,000 people in the stadium. Yeah. And as you would imagine, leaving is very well organized, but still chaos. Yes. So we were going, right, okay, should we, should we make a move? And Rick over here was not happy to make a move because he was watching his new best mate, best Mo pal, posters up on his bedroom wall. 
Mondo de Plantis absolutely smashed not only the gold medal, but the world record for the pole vault. And he did it in stage as well. He absolutely dragged it out. It was He's a proper showman, so I'm yeah. sure we're going to come on to this. Yeah. But he, he he did went he, he he won then he went for the Olympic record yeah and then he went for the world record and it was then so all much the way home on. as we were cycling back to our hotel Rick was just I love Mondo I love <laughs> Mo- I love Mondo it was more throughout the evening Rick just kept turning to us and being and like an a track event would happen and me and Andy would be talking about like oh wow and Rick would be like oh sorry I missed that I was just watching the pole vault <laughs> I've just I've just not seen anything like it the the pole vault I didn't go into last night thinking the pole vault was the thing that was going to catch it my eye for the for the entire. Uh, evening but it was phenomenal it was just one thing after another was going on in front of you and in the end the whole stadium yeah was watching the pole vault and it went on for hours yeah in the end because he'd won the gold medal and then we thought it just kept going kept going kept going and then when he actually did it Mm -hmm. when he got the world record at the end 6.25 meters the whole stadium erupted and it was like your team scoring a goal in yeah. the last minute of the FA Cup final. Just a very quick anecdote on the 3,000 metre steeplechase, which we enjoyed in the stadium. It was a bit bonkers. Um, one of the French athletes came around. I'm just going to check his name. Um, Louis, Ga- Louis Gilbert. Um, he came around almost for effectively a lap of honour on mm-hmm. the track. Clearly, like, embracing the incredible reaction that the French athletes have had from, yeah. from the stadium. Um, he'd just run his, his heat of the steeplechase and came mm-hmm. night. Mm-hmm. The first five qualified for the final. So he'd been knocked out and knew that. But he was the happiest guy in the stadium at this point, soaking up the applause from the crowd. And then he came and we're like, what's he doing? And he climbed onto the steeplechase barrier at the water jump. Yeah. And everyone's like, hey, everyone's thinking, oh, what's going to happen here? And then he did a backflip well, in, into, the water, into the water. Did he do a backflip or did he do a kind of half face plant? <laughs> well, <laughs> Undecided. I, also, it, it, it was a backflip after a bottle of Gavi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, the thing with the steeple chase jump is that it's it's like a slope right yeah. and he jumped so far towards the track he was that, into the that, shallow end yeah. <laughs> he yeah. was very much into the shallow end but i love it and i think that symbolizes like everyone within that stadium i know we have like gold medalists we have people that don't make it through get knocked out yeah. every single person in that stadium is one of the best athletes in the world and yeah. they're representing their country at the olympics i think that's something that a lot of people it probably won't sink in for a while because you go, oh, I'm disappointed. That is the epitome of celebrate the fact that you're Olympian. You've made yeah. it. You're in your home country. You've got a home crowd cheering you on and just like enjoy the show. And I was watching in the stands with uh, an old teammate of mine from Team GB, Hannah England, um, who now does some commentary work. And she um, she won a world championship silver medal at the 1500 meters. She finished fourth in the following world championships. That's back in 2011, 2013. And we were as... I suppose 1500 meter veterans sat there like absolutely buzzing to see what would happen. And she texted me this morning with a kind of a reminder of something that I said to her after about a lap and a half of the 1500 meters last night, when I kind of was like, oh, well now we know what Inga Britson's done, which is like he went to the beginning, went to the start, went to the front and just pushed the pace really hard right from the beginning. Mm. Too hard. Yes, as it turned out. But I turned to her and I was like, oh, now we know what he's going to do. It's boring, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How wrong yeah, were you? Yeah, yeah. Be- because I quite like it when it unfolds and there's surges and there's a lot of like, to, as a spectator, I hate it when I was running, but a lot mm. of ar- argy bargy, use that again, where people are physically trying to find their spot on the track and then yeah. you're waiting for one person to, to Which really make a break. What happened in, in, it feels like all of the previous rounds, we saw the people that wanted to kind of make it through to the semis and the finals mm. sit at the back, yeah. Wait until the last few laps. Is it 800 to go that we would usually yeah, make a move? 700 to go down the back straight. Off 700 there. to go, bam, to the front, see if how long they can hold it. Whereas this was a very different race. I wonder if the media commentators, us to a certain extent, are guilty of focusing so much on those two that we weren't actually looking at the other people who are in the race. Like, <laughs> if, I, if, if, I, if I was Cole Hocker, you know, 12 hours, 24 hours on from the race, I'd be thinking... The world is still talking about Inga Britson and Josh Kerr and not me, a 30 to 1 American underdog. Yeah. With with, with with a time that nobody even thought was going to get anywhere well, close to winning it, who actually had that strategy to come through. And his yeah. finish at the end was so well, strong. Let's talk about the strategy, I suppose. And what I think is important is that. So I, I guess with Hannah, we were definitely talking about the other guys. We still felt that. Josh and Inga Britson were where the, the battle was going to be and until 50 metres to go it was um, but uh, Cole Hocker ended up winning and don't forget here he 
in order to win, he ran 327, a brand new Olympic record. Yeah. Broke Ingebrigtsen's Olympic record. And when I was running, the Olympic record was 332. So, wow. so five it was seconds. five seconds is a massive yeah. gap. Obviously, some of that is track and spike technology, but also these guys are just have taken it to another level. But the world record was 326. If anyone went under 330 in a season, that was a, when I was competing, that was a kind of stellar, newsworthy moment. And that mm. person would likely be 40 meters ahead of the field. Yeah. And so now this whole field being dragged around, I think 10th place for Neil Gawley, who's another British athlete, was 3.30 and a personal best. Wow. So that's the context of how fast they are. But the, those guys, Cole Hocker, Jared Nagus, who came third, mm -hmm. and Josh Kerr. Um, so Josh Kerr was sandwiched between two Americans on the podium. Yeah. But all three of those came through the American collegiate system, which I think is really important. So they all ran at university in the States, which is this phenomenal level of competition. But we just have to quickly touch on women's 200 meter final. Yes, we do. Especially look at Rick's... Rick's Rin so got... annoyed. <laughs> Go on, look, quick 30 seconds. It was incredible. He's not annoyed. He's not annoyed. He, this is the person he loves the most in the world right now. Oh, sorry. That's why you're smiling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, right, we, imagine us. We're all sat at dinner, drinks in hand, and we're predicting who's going to win 200 meter final. I go Dean Rasher Smith. Yeah, I was like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> Other people. But then you say, you go Dina, and then they bring all the people out. And then you're like, oh, Gabby's in it. <laughs> 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 Gonna go Gabby. Did, but did he go all giddy? Yeah, what yeah. a run for Gabby Thomas. I mean, she is just unstoppable. She just looks so smooth. She's effortless in how she attacks the 200 meters. <laughs> So Rick's I now become the Rick Michael is... Johnson of the Running Channel yeah. podcast. He's going to analyze the, so uh, the sprinter's smooth, form. So just yeah. flies. I said, I, then I did another joke. I turned to Rick as well. And I was like, do you do you just want to support Gabby Thomas? Because you could change her name to Gabby Thomas. Yes. <laughs> oh, double, double wine pun, Sarah. A double wine pun. <laughs> That's good. Oh, and there's you. lots of head shakes behind the cameras. From yeah, the I know. Team. I'm so sorry. Um, but what a performance for Team GB. I know it must be yeah. gutting to be fourth so close to a medal. I think it was 0 0.02. Yeah, Dean Archer Smith 0 0.02 in fourth. And then Daryl Nita, who came fourth in the 100 metres, she came an incredible fifth here. And mm -hmm. it was nice to hear Dina's interview because she was buzzing for Julian Alfred, who won the hundred and came yeah. second in the two hundred who is her training partner. So oh, nice. um some like some really lovely interviews, but I, f I feel for them and I'm sure they're gonna come back very excited in the relay. Question time. Mm -hmm. Ashim from Prune in India, who's currently in the US. Don't know if they're on holiday or whatever, but yep. there you go. Uh dear Andy Rick and Sarah, I have a question about the chest bib numbers and the stickers with lane numbers stuck on the athletes. Why do we still need them? I'm sure there are better ways that meet the same purpose. Are they just a historical remnant of previous years? Ooh. So I, I immediately read this and thought, well, yeah, the, the, it's really backwards. So just for, for the purposes, the uh, leg numbers that you get, mm. people either stick on their shorts or on, the, on their legs themselves. They're stuck on. You get handed them immediately before going out onto the track. Those are to identify you in a side-on photo finish. Ah. So that's the purpose of those, so that ah. you can they can see your leg number if it's not immediately, you know, if two of you. I think the technology exists now where this probably isn't required, but then I'm not the one operating the photo finish um, or the, or the timing system. So really sticky. Sometimes they are, but sometimes you'll also. So you, I've had both versions. Some way you they leave a residue on your shorts when you peel them off after the race because you get different allocated a different lane position in every race so you, you you would discard them after every race that'd be right. so annoying if you have to wear the shorts out afterwards so i would um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that i don't think that's what happens but i would be superstitious to the point where you do get given enough kit to wear multiple vests and shorts yeah but if i was in the olympics or world championships and i qualify for the heats and i qualify for the semi-finals i would wear the same shorts same vest because i didn't know no. yeah. wow. so wait beijing you wore the same kit for heats to final yeah did you wash it? No. Oh, Andy. I, I, I <laughs> no. didn't know that. Isn't it a waterfall start as well? So you're not even in separate lanes for the 1500. So you all yes. stood quite close to people. Yes. Was that a tactic? I'm going to oh, smell hey. so bad. I, I think it was fine. No one will overtake well, look, me. I think it was fine. <laughs> good tactic. I Impress I wore pants. And I changed the pants. Oh, good. Yeah. Same socks? I probably did wear the same socks as well, yeah. No oh, way. Oh, no. <laughs> I feel like I'm... <laughs> 
17. I'm, no. I'm learning a lot about you in Paris. Um, back to the You're question. such Let's, a clean person, yeah, though. Back, well, I'll take that. Back back to the question. Um, <laughs> I've been given I, I one or two races in my career. They did give you adhesive numbers, so you literally just stuck them to your vest. Yeah. But if you're watching Diamond League races, and, and I'm not sure whether they're doing them at the Olympics here, but you go cross the line and they'll immediately run up to you and try and stick a, a number one sticker on the number one person's chest yeah. so that they can kind of keep track of you and have uh, a photo with you and yeah. then a number two and a number three. Those fall off almost immediately. So there must be something in the, the pins thing where, where it's like they've tried a budge because you can get little magnetic ones or little things that clip either side of your yeah. vest that are yeah. plastic, but the pins, um, they're just going to survive. That's yeah. one of those things where yeah. like in a hundred years time, They'll still have pins. we'll be, we won't yeah. be running anymore. We'll be hovering down the hundred meter straight, but it will still be pinned up. <laughs> Because you can't really see them either, right? So there's this assumption, I think, that when like the biggest superstars in track and field have got this clever system or whatever. Yeah. Like it, actually in, in, it has in, a chip in it as well, though, doesn't yeah, it? So in the front get, of the bib. The, the front front bib has a the timing chip in it as well. No, I love it. I just think, you know, is yeah. it whether you're doing your first 5K or you're running 5K yeah. in the Olympics, you'll yeah. ha you still have to pin your bib on. We're halfway there. Ooh. We hope you're enjoying <laughs> the 10 Days in Paris podcast. We are loving doing this. I think I'll stick with Davidge. <laughs> <laughs> what for your music choice yeah. please do keep emailing in podcast at the channel.com if you have any questions or suggestions for us and thanks so much to asics for helping us do this we'll see you for the next one